missed it. I missed you. I was, I was, I have no excuse. But I love what God is doing in this place today. Just that encounter with God's presence. You found you found it. I don't have it all together either. I think, <laughs> I think we're still in wedding uh, wedding mode. That's right. We got back from our daughter Madison's wedding in Idaho, and we had such a beautiful time. Just that um, that sacred space where you make those vows. It was good remembrances, even for us. Um, and it feels so good to be back and replenishing. And, you know, when we were in that northern Idaho, they are in severe drought. I mean, that whole west coast is in drought, and it's dry, it's dusty. And then knowing that rain is coming here, even today, the, the chance of rain, I really believe that what God's doing physically with the atmosphere, sending rain, um, he's also doing spiritually. Amen. And I'm so ready for that. How about you? Amen. Just ready to say, God, just rain down. What do you want to do to yeah. soak this, um, this place, this uh, heart of mine, so that it, it's just saturated with, with all the things of God and what God wants to do? So I just want us to pray as we start this service that God will literally Amen. have his way. He inhabits the praises of his people. So right from the very first note, I just invite you, don't sit back and observe for a while. Let's just enter right in. Praise God. To say, God, Good. what you have for us is what we want. Would you pray with me? Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for today. Today oh, is a yeah, gift, yeah. Lord, and we receive it as such. Praise you, Lord. Oh, Lord, come and have your way among us. I thank you for every thank piece you, of this service and how you've woven it yes, together with beautiful threads yes, to bring us to a place of surrender, God, mm -hmm. from every song and every scripture and, and how the word confronts um, the truth that Amen. we need you. God, we are desperate for you. Some of us have been desperate for years and haven't even known it. But today, you're showing us that there is hope found in Jesus and everything we need, it comes from you, God. So we open up our hands and we open up our hearts and we say, have your way in this place. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Would you take a minute and listen to our announcements? Good morning, Good morning celebration. celebration. My name is Sarah. And I'm Luke. And we just want to say welcome. If it's your first time here, would you take a second to fill out a Connect card in the seat back in front of you and turn it into the Welcome Center to receive a free t-shirt or travel mug? Church, we have the seventh annual golf outing coming up. September 18th, registrations are now open. So if you want to get in, get maybe a group of four. Church, we would love to have you come out to this awesome event. We have water baptism coming up Sunday, October 31st. You can sign up on our app or website under registrations. We have a membership class coming up, and so maybe you're new to Celebration. Uh, maybe you've been coming for the past couple of months, or maybe you've been here for a few years, and, and you want to get involved in membership at our church. We have a class that's coming up. That is also uh, available through registrations via the app or on our website. And we would love to have you just come find out a little bit more about what we're about here at Celebration. Folks, we have an awesome opportunity. We are selling giant gift cards as our cash for causes opportunity here in the sanctuary. At the table, you can buy a giant gift card. Yeah, it's a great way to help support our children and to send them to camp. Speaking of camp, we leave tomorrow. So parents, if your kids are coming to camp with us, make sure you have them at the church by 1 p.m. 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Church Night at the Races is here this yes. week. This Friday night at 7.30 at Williams Grove Speedway, Celebration Community Church is going out. Uh, there's going to be a memorial for Billy Kimmel, and uh, it's going to be an awesome time of fellowship with each other. So please come out to it. We'd love to see you guys there. You can drop your tithe and offering in the offering box located next to the doors, or you can give conveniently on our online app. Thank you, church, so much for giving. Now let's prepare our hearts for worship and the word. Hey, good morning, church family. Let's go ahead and stand this morning as we worship together. Come on, let's put our hands together. Yes. Come on, we're going to start with some praise this morning. We're going to give the praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's get ready. We are a sea of voices, we 
break the walls apart open the heavens almighty god you are overcomer defender of my heart by your power the oceans open
church. If you need it, if you feel like you need to come to the altar this morning, they're open. Don't stay in your seat. If you need to have a moment between you and Jesus this morning, they're open. Please come. Come on, we're going to make room for him this morning. Here is where I lay it down. Every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. surrender it this morning here is where I lay it down every burden every crown this is my surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay it down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender Do whatever you want to, yes. 
Listen to the lies that the enemy is bringing to you. Do not listen to the lies that the enemy is bringing to you. For church, lies are not of God. If it does not align with his word, it is not of him. So if you're hearing the word that you're not good enough, it's false. It does not align with the word of God. He says, you are more than enough. You are more than enough, that you are sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And all we have to do is open up, is open up and let him come in. Do not listen to the lies of the devil. He is here to steal and kill and destroy. Do not let him do that in you. Do not let him do that in your family. You need to make room, make room right now. Make room in your homes. Make room in your cars, in your workspaces. Make room for him to enter in, to enter in and surrender it all to him. Come on, church. We can't hold on to things that are not of God. We can't hold on to our giftings and our talents. They're not ours. They're his. He gave them to us to use for his good. We can't hold on to them. We have to let it go. Let go and let God. We have to do it, church such a time as this the world needs to see us letting go and letting God work through our lives work through our churches work through our communities and our families oh Jesus come on come on let's make room and I will make room for you oh Jesus to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Come on, lift it up again. And I will make room for you. Oh, Jesus. To do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Yes, Jesus. Oh, you've come on a great Sunday. Get ready. The Lord is going to continue to minister to us in a deep, some deep places today. I'm glad that you're here. Um, why don't you be seated for a moment? I want to introduce to you a young man and uh, his wife and uh, a little new baby uh, who have bought, brought their surrender to the Lord and have been called as missionaries to the country of Italy. His name is Jay Worth. He used to be a youth pastor at Pincho Park a uh, number of years ago, and God just called him out of there and is uh, preparing him for the mission field. 
So I want you to just take a few moments, Jay, introduce yourself, if, if you will, your wife and child, and uh, tell us a little bit about what God has in store for you. Good morning. It's good to be here with you this morning. Seen lots of familiar faces from our time over here. Um, just, uh, it's hard to believe just a year ago I was had a flat tire in Jen Courtney's driveway. Um, thank you for the polite laugh. I appreciate that. <clears throat> As Pastor Mike said, my name is Jay. Uh, my wife Stephanie and uh, daughter Viola are back there next to our table. Viola had... Uh, she normally sleeps through the night like 12 hours at a stretch, like a champ. She's been doing that for a couple of months. And last night, for whatever reason, she woke up like three times. So <clears throat> she's on the struggle bus this morning, and so are we, but that's okay. God is good. We are um, with AGWM, Assemblies of God World Missions. We are missionary associates. We're heading to a town in northern Italy called Padova to work with university students at the University of Padova. So I want to talk to you a minute about Iran. I know it's a left turn. Hang it with me. Um, Iran, like most countries around the world, is made up of different ethnic groups, right? Uh, the, the largest of those are, are people that identify as ethnically Persian. Uh, there's those people that are of Turkish descent. There's Arabs. There's all these different groups, right? So why am I talking about Iran when we're headed to Italy? There are more evangelical Christians among the Persian population in Iran than there are in three entire European countries. Okay? Uh, Greece. Belgium and Italy all have fewer believers than just the Persian population of Iran. The reality of that means that most Europeans, many Europeans are going to live their entire lives and die without ever meeting a Bible literate, Bible believing Christian that can introduce them to Jesus. Never. Europe used to be the great center of Christendom, right? This is the, this is the continent that put a, put a church in every little town and, and city and, and hamlet across the continent and across the world. And it's the place where the Reformation happened. It's now spiritually dark beyond imagination. And, and those cathedrals, these, these glorious monuments to, to what you, Christianity used to represent in that place have just become a a checklist item for people that are on vacation, right? And the real twisted irony, these are the places where people used to go in generations past and hear about uh, how they can die to themselves and about how they can experience fullness of life with Christ. And now what are they doing? They've become selfie spots, right? They've become a place that people go to build their own kingdom instead, I want to share with you out of Isaiah chapter 55 this morning. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, I'm going to start in verse 8. And the beginning of this passage is something that many of us are familiar with. Isaiah 55, 8 re reads, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We're all familiar, many of us are familiar with that passage, right? We use this to kind of console ourselves when, you know, something goes wrong in our world and, and we don't understand why it's happening. We, this is our lament, right? Well, oh, well, God's ways are so much higher. Somebody's told you that before, and it was super helpful, I'm sure. We kind of use this as this, this uh, well, I guess I just won't understand on this side of it. And, and God is so different than us that that's part of the story. But there's a deeper meaning here if we keep reading. <clears throat> I'm going to keep going in verse 10. The rain and the snow come down from the heavens, and they stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always, not sometimes, not occasionally, not always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere, not some places, everywhere I send it. God tells us we can't possibly understand his ways because whenever he sends his word out, it accomplishes what he intended. We make our own plans all the time. We try to do our own stuff all the time and fail it's not just that God is so alien and different than us that we can't understand his ways. We can't figure out how he makes things work all the time. 
And he does. We can't understand his ways because we can't understand how he never fails. Keep reading, verse 12. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. Look at verse 13 there. What God is saying, he says, where it used to be difficult, right? Where, where you used to get beat up and bloodied and bruised trying to work the soil, that's going to become the fertile ground again. Because his ways, and that's what's happening all across Europe, right? God is taking and, and, and starting to shift hearts all across the continent and that hard ground that has for generations become kind of uh, uh, very secular. It's become about the self. God is starting to do a new thing in this place, and he is turning that into fertile ground once again. Because his ways are not our ways, because where he sends his will, we know it will prevail. Because that soil is becoming fertile again, we are going to Europe. You know, I've always been fascinated by tapestries, all right, um, not to, whoa, did I just do something? Just felt like it got louder. Um, not because, you know, if you're an artist, I don't want to, my wife's an artist, I'm not trying to insult any artistic types, but if you're working with like acrylic, right, and you, and you mess something up, you can just like paint over the canvas or you can gesso over it and start over, right? Tapestries, though, combine this like hyper creativity. You have to have the whole thing visualized in your head and then with this incredible attention to detail and planning because as a, someone is weaving a tapestry, if the threads are out of place in one place, like, like halfway through, and you don't notice it, it's going to shift the whole perspective, the whole work out of perspective, right? And it impacts every other thread that's woven through it. This is what our journey into missions has been like. Um, Pastor Mike mentioned we pastored at Pincho Park uh, just down the road for, for 10 years. And when we felt like God was calling us to something else, um, we knew it was missions, but we didn't know what. And we didn't know where, we didn't know what that looked like. And we heard a lot of, well, yeah, just go and, and, then, hang, and then hang on. <laughs> How many of y'all know that's frustrating when you don't know what you're supposed to, <laughs> when you don't know what you're supposed to be doing? Um, and God didn't answer us right away, which was, was doubly frustrating. But this opportunity for ministry didn't even exist yet. Um, so there were some pastors that took over an international church there in Padova and uh, all of a sudden university students started showing up. And, and the University of Padova is one of the oldest institutions of higher learning in Europe. Galileo was on staff. It's still considered very prestigious. And um, students come from all over Europe to study there. It's one of, one of the best respected universities on the continent. But not only that, uh, just before COVID shut everything down, they had a huge influx of students from Iran. How many of you all know it's tough to get a missionary into Iran? Um, and the website for the university, at the click of a button, obviously it's in Italian because the university is in Italy, right? But you can click a button and translate the whole site into English, which is kind of expected. That's like the universal business language. Uh, you can also click a button and translate the entire site into Mandarin Chinese. They have so many Chinese nationals that come to the University of Padova that, that uh, they have to have to have the website available in Mandarin. God's positioned us to minister not only to these secularized Europeans, but from one place, from one strategic location, we're going to be able to minister to university students, disciple them, send them where they're going around the world after they're done, from a single place. We're asking for you to partner with us. Yes, we need prayer. I have to find a pediatrician that speaks English in a foreign country. Please pray for me. But really, we want you to pray, too, that um, the Lord would open up hearts. We want that ground not to be, uh, not just for us, but because other missionaries have spent generations and years plowing that ground. We're praying for fertile soil. So pray that hearts are open to receive the gospel there. And, and then we do need uh, financial support still. Um, Missionaries have two budgets to raise. You have a cash budget that pays for like your one-time stuff like visas and plane tickets. Uh, it was a little weird when uh, Assemblies of God found out we were pregnant. They changed our budget and I have two plane tickets going there but three coming back. 
because she'll be old enough by the time we get back. <laughs> kind of messed with my head a little bit. Uh, but that's what cash gifts pay for. And then we need monthly support. That's the stuff that keeps us on the ground that pays rent and electric and healthcare and all the fun adult things that we have to take care of. So uh, I would just ask that you, you pray with us and, and prayerfully consider. I know the Lord is speaking to some of you this morning. Consider letting your thread be woven alongside ours as God is advancing his kingdom in Europe. Jay, we're so proud of you for responding to the call of the Lord. And I know this church, we love to send, send people out. And we're gonna, we want to partner with you. We're going to support you as a church, $50 a month. Um, and uh, if you would like to give a love offering, you're welcome to do that. Just drop it in the box on your way out. Everything marked, just put it in the memo, missionary, put Italy in there, and we'll make sure that all that goes to you. Uh, we believe in what you're doing. Um, amazing opportunity. So we want to get behind this, uh, this family here. Can you imagine just you know, leaving an income, leaving a, a full-time job, and taking a wife and a small child to another country? I mean, it takes great faith and courage, and uh, we know that the Holy Spirit is going to give you that boldness that you need. Uh, and uh, we're going to be praying for you and look forward to when you come back for your first visit back to the States, and we want to hear a good report. And, uh, but uh, aren't, you, aren't you proud of these guys? And being, being a missionary during COVID, uh, I mean, I know what it's like to be a pastor during COVID. You just can't really make the right decision in everybody's eyes. But, uh, I mean, trying to book services when churches were unsure if they're going to open or how they're going to open and uh, so it has been just a challenge even to get opportunities to be in a church, to share the need, uh, but uh, we're glad that we can partner with you. So, you so let's, let's pray for him, all right? Would you extend a hand this way? and Let's bless them. Father, we do. We bless them with protection. We bless them with your favor, God, that all of their needs and more will be met yes. according to your riches and glory. And we know you're not broke, God. Uh, you're, you're a prosperous God. You, uh, you desire to pour upon your children uh, your, what is needed and more so that we can continue to advance your kingdom in dark places, Lord. Thank you for this open door, um, and I thank you for this, this servant's heart that's open to serve you in this great way. So bless them. Keep them free from sickness and disease in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we pray, God, that doors will open beyond what's already open now, Lord God. We pray for divine connections uh, with, the, with people that will just help continue to serve the advancement of your kingdom, Lord. And thank you for our opportunity to come alongside them. And Lord, bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jay. God bless you. Nice to see you, Stephanie. Why don't you say hi to them? On your way out today, drop a gift in the love offering. Uh, that'll be very helpful. Um, just with that in mind, don't forget... Uh, your sacrifice. So Sundays too uh, was last Sunday and, and still an opportunity to give. I know we were away, so I've got to check and be giving uh, our gift this Sunday. We'll keep collecting gifts for the next couple weeks and continue to pay off one acre or more. Amen? Amen. We'll take your communion cup and take a moment. You can get, get it ready. It takes a little bit. It's kind of tricky sometimes. So if you will remove that wafer. And uh, I want to read a passage of Scripture while you're getting prepared. Look what it says. When you came to Christ, this is Paul to the Colossians. He's saying, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised. But not in a physical sense. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Whoa. And uh, that's going to be unpacked a little bit here this morning. Cutting away the sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life, because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of our sins. He canceled, isn't this a beautiful verse here? Get ready. He canceled the record of the charges against us. Whew. And he took it away by nailing it to the cross. 
In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them where on the cross. So when we take communion, we're partnering with what Christ already did in shaming the devil. And, and the, the strategy that he has had against you and humankind since the very beginning. And the good news is that there's been victory already declared over the devil. He's a defeated foe. And because Christ disarmed him, made, rendered him powerless, he's still powerless. He hasn't been given back, you know, the ability to touch the children of God. So we are victors in Christ. Do you know that after Abraham Lincoln in, in Gettysburg, made the Gettysburg Address and the Emancipation Proclamation when slavery was abolished in this country, do you know it took years for word to trickle down, trickle out to the plantations and to the slave owners and to the actual slaves to know that they were already free. They were declared free from slavery. It took years for word to get out. Do you know in the same sense, there's many people who don't know that there's been victory declared over them. They haven't responded in faith to receive that. And that's why we do what we do. We're getting word out that this work has already been done on the cross. That's why our job is not finished. In fact, Paul was, or Peter later said, God's giving us more time to get the word out because he wants all to come to repentance. So that's why we have such an important job not just receiving communion and, oh, that's so wonderful for us, but to get the word out to others that you can be set free, that you have victory in Christ. And that's why people like Jay are going around the world to get the word out. Amen? So when we take this communion, we're remembering what Christ did on the cross. Take the wafer if you would. Why don't you crack it, break it, representing the breaking of Jesus' body on the cross. It was broken for you and me. Aren't you glad for that? Once you, before you eat that, let's just thank him for it. Thank you, God. You went to the cross. Your son went to the cross. And, and Lord, we thank you for the work that was done. Now you are the bread of heaven. And we take this bread even as spiritual nourishment to our bones. <laughs> we receive that now in Jesus' name. Go ahead and eat the bread. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And this grape juice represents the blood of Jesus. And just as in the Civil War, 650,000 plus lives shed their blood for the freedom of slaves, so Jesus' blood was shed so that multiple millions and billions of people could be saved forgiven of our sins. Our debts are canceled. Don't drag, don't drag that sin, don't drag that condemnation around with you one day longer. It has been canceled in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's thank Him for that. Thank you for that, Jesus. We know we can't do it by ourselves. You did it for us. With that comes a great responsibility to carry it and to help others to find forgiveness from their sins. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, let's drink together. Jesus paid it Hallelujah. All yes, let's sing this together. To him I owe. Sin had, had left, left a, a crimson stain. stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I mentioned how in the Word today, uh, some of that, the effects of the sinful nature are going to be kind of we're going to dig into that this morning. I'm not going to do it. I've asked uh, Dr. Peter Ginter to share the words. And amen. Amen. Uh, we were in Idaho doing the wedding, and it really uh, has allowed me not to have to prepare a sermon for this Sunday. But 
Dr. Peter's got a doctorate of theology, but I know that's, even to him, it's just a title. A lot of work has gone into that. But uh, he wants to share a little bit about, I think, a really a powerful um, effect of prayer, inner healing prayer, that can get down to places where sometimes God begins to convict us, maybe in a service like this where we hear the word, but we don't make as much room for that work of completion to heal from some of the things in our past. So get ready. This is a, God's going to dig really deep here this morning, and I want you to welcome uh, Peter Ginther to share this morning. God bless you, brother. Well, I appreciate Mike setting this, this stage for this, the setting, uh, because... Yes, I agree. The sinful nature has been cut away. And we have freedom in Christ that we need to learn about and know about. And that's why I want to talk with you about formational prayer this morning. A couple of years ago, I had a, a picture during my quiet time with the Lord where the Lord took me back in my memory to the town where I grew up, Stony Run. It's a little town between Kutztown and Hamburg in Berks County. And the Lord took me back to this town. Uh, it's a type of town where there's just one road going through the town, Route 737. You come down Route 737 in the middle of town. There's a sharp turn, and you're heading out of town already. Surrounded by farmland, um, you, there was a little store on the south side of town called Aunt Jenny's Country Store. I used to go in there to buy candy and just to check it out because they had a lot of neat things in Aunt Jenny's country store. In front of the store, there was a hitching post remaining there from the days when 737 used to be a dirt road and people rode horses. But now, that, those days were gone. But in this picture that the Lord gave me, taking me back to Stony Run, there was a sign hanging on the hitching post that said, do not tie horses here. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because there's a major road right there. You wouldn't want to tie your horse there. But in real life, I didn't remember that sign being there. This was all in the picture the Lord was giving me. And so I thought this sign was really interesting. And so I took this sign. And I thought, I'm going to take this home and hang it in front of my house. So I went to the other side of town, went around the sharp turn, and my house was the last house on the left, going out of town, and I was looking all around. Now my house, I did not have a hitching post in front of it for horses. In fact, it was a, a molded cement block wall with a terrace. And so I'm looking, where can I hang this sign? I really wanna hang this sign. And I was frustrated. And I asked the Lord, what is the meaning of this picture? Where are you going with this? And the Lord said to me, you really want to hang that sign in front of your home, don't you? But there's no room for it. There's no place for your do not tie horses here. In fact, there's no room on this side of town where you now live for any of your do not little signs, your little do not signs. Do not do this. Do not do that. There's no room. They don't belong here because you're under grace. You're no longer under law, and that sign no longer applies to your life. That picture that the Lord gave me helped to set me free to a new degree to legalism, from legalism that I think as a teenager, I was a bit more legalistic than I realized. Last week, Pastor Dave Sherman shared about how the Lord spe spoke to him in a picture, and that picture transformed him. Pictures have a way of transforming us in a way that we can never go back. I want to draw on the messages of the past three weeks, Pastor Mike's two messages and Dave's message last week, to talk to you this morning about transformation, formational prayer. Formational prayer is a special type of prayer called formational because it deals with the formational events in our lives, and in itself, the prayer becomes a formational event. So let's go back four weeks to Pastor Mike's message. We'll go back to Achan, Achan's story. Back to Achan, not your Achan back, but back to Achan. Joshua chapter 7, revisited. 
This is the story. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about 3,000 went up. But they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. You recall this story? Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us? What can I say now that the Israelites have been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out your, our name from the earth. Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt like God abandoned you? Joshua and the Israelites felt this way at this time. They had just come, across, come off a great victory over Jericho where they didn't even have to fight. The Lord did the fighting for them. They walked around the city for seven days and on the seventh day they walked around seven times and shouted praise and the walls came tumbling down and they just went in and took over the city. Now they come to AI and they think, oh, this will be a piece of cake. But they get routed soundly. 36 men, 36 husbands, 36 fathers killed. And what is worse, now they, are, they cross the Jordan. There is no going back. You can't, God miraculously opened the Jordan for them to come across. There was no going back. Here they are. The Canaanites are going to hear about this, how they lost to AI, and they are sitting ducks. So they cried out to God, God, why did you do this? Why did you bring us here if you're going to desert us? The nations will hear about this. Ever have a time where you felt like God had abandoned you? Pastor Dave shared last week about a time when, recently when he was in the hospital with COVID. And he shared how he asked that very question. He was angry at God. Why God? Why, is this, why are you doing this? And he, David, uh, Pastor Dave even said, you know, I use language that you wouldn't expect me to use with God, right? Yeah. You find, this all th you find this in many people's lives. Jesus' disciples, when they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, and a storm came up and started, the waves started crashing over the boat and started sinking the boat while Jesus is asleep on a pillow in the back of the boat. And the disciples go and wake him up and say, Master, don't you care if we drown? In our lives, does it feel like Jesus is sleeping? Master, don't you care if I drown? I know in my life I've experienced this. When Cheryl and I moved to South Carolina for me to pursue my master's degree, we didn't find a job for nine months. And then we ended up sinking deeper and deeper into educational loan debt. And I didn't understand, God, where are you? There were so many times I walked the floor of our mobile home at nighttime, singing those words of Russ Taff, when peace cannot be found, and sleep won't visit me tonight, a restless mind that I can't tame, I walk the floors, I call your name. And finally, silence, and the tears begin to fall. I think we can all relate to those times. I think we all have times like that in our lives. And my first point this morning is that intense life situations are often intense listening opportunities. Difficult times get our attention unlike any other times. And God is about to share something with us we have never heard, never learned, never experienced through any other means than through these difficulties. We often cry out to God in times like this. Remove the symptoms. Take away the pain. 
Silence the waves and calm the sea. Where are you, Lord? God gets our attention. And then do we hear back? We say, where are you, God? And we hear silence. Or maybe like Job who cried out, we get an answer like, brace yourself like a man. God, that's not the answer I needed. But these situations get our attention. Every day, Jesus is sitting at the, f- at the fireplace of our heart, wanting to have fellowship with us, to talk with us. Day after day, he invites us to fellowship with him. But day after day, we say, I'm too busy. I got to keep going. I got to keep moving. I don't have time right now. So difficult times get our attention, unlike any other times in our lives. How did the Lord respond to Joshua when they cried out? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Pastor Dave, what did the Lord say when you cried out to him and you said, why are you doing this, Lord? Yeah, he said, well, I think, did you say shut up? He said, shut up. <laughs> Sit down and listen. When, when the disciples woke Jesus up, I'm sorry. When the disciples woke Jesus up in the boat, what did Jesus do? He said, he said, Where, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? And he rebuked them for their little faith. Sorry. Job, when Job, when Job questioned God, when Job was going through his suffering, again, God said to Job, God said, God said to Job, you know, brace yourself like a man. Where were you when I created the foundations of the earth? You know, God can confront to us with our sin and say, you know, we want comfort and help, but God comes to us and, and confronts us with things that need to be dealt with. It's often easier to see the fruit of sin than the root of sin. This is my second point. We get into these situations and we cry out to God and we say, what are you doing, God? But Pastor Mike taught us this lesson last week or in his message. You can't pray your way out of situations you behaved your way into. We often can't see in ourselves the behaviors that got us into these situations. God had to tell Joshua, the Israelites have stolen, the Israelites have lied, the Israelites have taken things and made them their own. Joshua had no way of knowing that. He was completely clueless to what was happening in the camp. God said to Dave, David the other week when he's in the hospital, to Pastor Dave, he said, be quiet and listen. God said to Peter, you're too legalistic. I didn't realize I had a legalistic problem. But he showed me, you're too legalistic. All your little do not signs, they need to go. So God reveals to us things that we could never see on our own. Why is it that you can't pray your way out of situations you behaved your way into? Why not? Because God loves you too much to allow these behaviors to continue. If, if God would get us out of the situations, the behaviors would just continue and we find ourselves back in those situations again and again and again. But God said to Joshua, I can't, you can't stand against your enemies. I won't go with you until you deal with this. So God wants to deal with that behavior. He wants to get at the root of it. You can't pray your way out of situations you behaved your way into, but perhaps you can pray your way out of the behaviors that got you into those situations. Here are some behaviors that get us into situations. We, off, 
in the church we talk about these dysfunctional behaviors, these sins, and these are just a few. Performance, workaholism, people pleasing, addiction to approval, addiction to attention, rescuing, manipulation, perfectionism, chemical abuse, alcohol abuse, sexual addiction, eating disorder, shopping addiction, kleptomania, gambling addiction, da 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 da. What, what is the addiction? What is the behavior that keeps us trapped individually? Can we reason our way out of these? I mean, the Bible says, Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Can we reason our way out of these things? To a degree, yes, we do need to renew our minds. But many times, even renewing our mind and changing our thinking doesn't get us out of these completely. Does, can we do um, behavioral modification with rewards and punishments? To a degree, we can do that. But you see, the problem is, these are not the roots. These are the branches. We need to get to the root. If you don't dig the dandelion out by the root, it's going to grow back again next year. How do we do that, though? Well, let's look at what God said to Joshua in this situation. How did he get to the root? He said, go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son... Give glory to God, to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder, a beautiful ro- saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver Underneath, Sometimes we do such a good job of hiding our own sins, we ourselves cannot even see them. Joshua had no way of knowing that this had taken place. It was the Lord who revealed it to him. This is my third point. God is able to reveal things to us in his presence that we can never reason our way to knowing. Follow the science friction. In this situation, There was an intense life situation. Israel defeated by AI. There was sinful behavior, stealing and lying. And many times in the church we try to keep it at that level. We just want to try and address the sinful behavior. Or in our lives we try to address the sinful behavior without going any deeper. And it doesn't work. God had to deal with it. They, come into, they came into his presence. They presented themselves tribe by tribe, out of tribe by tribe, clan by clan. Out of clan by clan, God revealed family by family. Every step of the way, God is revealing. It's this family, not that family. It's this man, not that man. Until they came to Achan and he had to confess. He confessed. God worked below the surface in Revelation and dealt with every Revealed the sin every step of the way. The same is true for us today. God wants us to come into his presence so that he can work with us step by step and get to the root of what's happening in our lives. And I say follow the science friction. Friction because today we hear a lot of people saying follow the science. Follow the science. Well, which science are we following? Because every person's science is built upon a foundation of assumptions and presuppositions. And whoever, whatever assumptions or presuppositions you lay, that's going to determine which way the house is going to lean. 
All right? So we need to follow the science friction. We as Christians have assumptions, foundational assumptions we need to follow. And that is we believe in both reason and revelation. We believe, you know, when people say follow the science, most of the people believe that reason is king. Reason is everything, and you got to follow the reasoning. But we as Christians, we live between the biblical tension of reason and revelation. Yes, we need reason. We don't check our brains at the door when we become a Christian. But reason doesn't take us all the way. We need revelation also. And the Holy Spirit brings us revelation. So how does this apply to our situations today? Difficult life situation. God speaks to us in our difficult life situations. We have sinful behaviors. We need to come into the Lord's presence. And we say to the Lord, you know, reveal to me what underlies my sinful behaviors. What underlies our sinful behaviors? Pastor Mike shared with us the answer to this two weeks ago when we looked at James chapter four. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Here's the dysfunctional, the sinful behaviors, fighting and quarreling and killing quarreling and fighting in the church. What is the cause of it? They come from your desires that battle within you. You desire, but you do not have. You covet. You want to spend on your own pleasures. And in James chapter 1, James put it this way. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after evil desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. What underlies our sinful behaviors is evil desire. Now let me ask you the question, though. Did God create us with evil desires? No, God only created us with good desires. Back to the Garden of Eden, and Mike took us back there at the beginning of this series on Own It. Back to the Garden of Eden, God created us with desires that were meant to be fulfilled in relationship with him. In the garden, you had safety and security. In the garden, you had significance and personal worth. God put mankind in charge of all creation. You had purpose and meaning. You had unconditional love Because God was there. Belonging and acceptance. Adam and Eve belonged and accepted each other. But when those desires are seek, when we seek to meet those desires apart from God, that's when they become evil desires. When Adam and Eve sinned and lost relationship with God, they had to go out and try and get those desires met on their own. And so they experienced emotional upheaval. They had shame. They felt guilt. And they, they turned on each other. So really, what underlies our sinful behaviors are emotional upheavals. We have these core longings for safety and security and significance and meaning and acceptance. And when we don't get those met, when, we, when those are not met in our lives, that causes turmoil in us. You look at these, these dysfunctional behaviors, these sinful behaviors, and think about them. Performance looking for our love, workaholism, looking for safety and security, people-pleasing, wanting acceptance and, and belonging. And when you don't get those things, it causes pain. And so we drown out the pain with alcohol abuse, sexual addiction, chemical abuse, eating disorders. We're either looking to get our needs met by these behaviors, or because we're not getting our needs met, we're looking to kill the pain. And so under our sinful behaviors are emotional upheavals for unmet core longings. Under emotional upheavals, emotional upheaval is really like the check engine light on the dashboard. When you are experiencing emotional upheavals in your life, that's really a sign that something's going on in the engine of your soul that needs fixing, that there's a false belief at work in your life. Pastor Mike talked, touched on this in his sermon the other week when he said, you know, a lot of us 
put our, we look to other people, a special other person, to fill our need for love and security. And when that person disappoints us, we get angry at them, we get hurt, and we reject them. The false belief there was that we trust, we were looking to another person to fulfill us. You complete me. That's such a lie. Another person doesn't complete us. It's God who completes us. The problem with false beliefs is that the problem with false beliefs is that we often pick up these false beliefs unconsciously. We were all born with mirror neurons. One of the fascinating things as I worked on my PhD was to learn about mirror neurons. And if you want to see some really interesting videos, go to YouTube and Google or search mirror neurons. It's amazing. Mirror neurons, even from a baby, are, they give us the capability to imitate others. And what's really fascinating is we're not just imitating others, but we're imitating the intention and the feelings behind the behaviors of others. That's why facial expressions are so important to a baby. A baby can imitate facial expressions and read, is mom happy? Is mom sad? Is mom angry? Is dad happy? Is dad frustrated? They can tell by the facial features. And they don't think it consciously, but it's in their emotions. And so we pick up a lot of these false beliefs just by imitating others. That's why when you watch a football game, you can get so angry in the football game or so excited because it's not the player on the field who's facing fourth and goal. It's you. You're watching them, but you're feeling it as if you were the one on the field. <laughs> and so we watch TV and we see someone who's hurt and who's angry. And how do they deal with it? Oh, they beat someone up or they shoot someone. Or we watch a person on the field uh, on TV and how do they get their love needs met? Through other people. And so we pick up these lies, these false beliefs, without even consciously thinking about it, but it goes right to our emotions. Underneath, I'll come back to this, sorry. Underneath false belief are deep wounds. Many of our false beliefs are caused by deep wounds. Someone in our lives, there, there might be a trauma, someone in our life did wrong to us, someone in our life who was supposed to do good to us did evil to us. It may be a, a simple thing, and I think we can relate to this, you know, you, someone, um, you fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And that becomes our life motto. Because of a deep wound, we put that as our false belief. That's the way I'm going to live from now on. No one's ever going to get even with me or get, take advantage of me again. And we build up these me coping mechanisms into our lives. So these false beliefs often happen at an unconscious level. Terry Wardle, I love this saying. Terry Wardle gives this saying. There are things in life that are true but they are not real to us. While there are other things that are real to us, but they are not true. Our identity in Christ, you are a saint. You are holy. You are righteous. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. You are loved by God. You're a child of God. Yeah, yeah, that's true, but it's not really where I'm at. I don't feel that. That's not really me. While there are other things that are real, what I really feel, I feel like I'm a sinner. I feel like I'm no good, like I'm, I'm lousy. But that's not true. This saying brings out the difference between the experiential and the cognitive, between the episodic. What we've experienced in life, our memories, what has been built up in, in the pictures of our mind versus the cognitive, which are just the rational part of us. And both of these need to be transformed. We read in Romans chapter 12, Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the thoughts. That's the rational. That's the reasoning. That needs to be transformed. We need to learn our identity in Christ. We need to know who we are in Christ. But even beyond that, Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6 says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live according to in accordance with the Spirit, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And the mind governed by the flesh is death, while the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The word for mind here is not just your thoughts. 
It's the mental pictures upon which the thoughts are built. It's the episodes of your life. We need new experiences to counteract, to go against the old experiences of the flesh. So deep wounds lead to false beliefs. But that's not the end of the story. This is where formational prayer comes in. We have an encounter with Christ. Our episodic memory will always trump our cognitive thoughts. So if we have memories of events in our lives where we learned I'm no good, you're not, even as much as you try and reason your way out of that, it's not going to work. You need a new episodic memory. Now, you can have episodic memory, a new memory, just by being part of the church community. I can experience unconditional love by my church community, and that will build a whole new world for me. But formational prayer seeks to build those new memories through encounters with Christ. And the best way to demonstrate this is just to share from my own life. Let me walk through this sharing my life. I've struggled with emotional upheaval, anxiety. Anxiety was a real problem for me. Now, how did that... Um, because I felt insecure. And where I traced that back to was when I was nine years old, my father was killed in a freak accident. And I think even at the age of nine, though I didn't think this through, but at the age of nine, I think I came up with the false belief, well, if my dad can be gone just overnight like that, anyone can be gone. Life can be gone. Life can be different. And so I filled up these false beliefs that I need to take control of things. My sinful behavior, budgeting, okay? Now, that doesn't sound like a very sinful thing, keeping a budget. But when it controls you, okay, if I can keep a budget, control the money, um, I'll be all right. I'll be able to make it in life. Difficult life situation, that caused some friction with my wife and I because it drove her crazy the way I kept to the budget. Every time I spent some money, I had to write it down and record it. That was my way of controlling. Lord gave me a picture a couple of years ago. Lord took me back in my memory to a retreat, a men's retreat in New York State that I went to. We were out in the countryside, and the men, we were sitting around the campfire at night. So in my mind's eye, I see myself pick, sitting around the campfire with these men, and Jesus comes into the picture and sits down next to me. Around the fire, Jesus is sitting next to me. And he put his arm around me. Now, when my dad died, it was a very traumatic thing, as you can imagine. And it really threw my whole family into a whirlwind. Um, my mother was left overnight to raise three teenagers and a nine-year-old. And Jesus put his arm around me. And he said, you know, your mother did the best she could with what she had. Now let me do the best I can do with what I have. And just that picture, wow, Jesus wants to do the best he can in my life with what he has, which is immeasurable. Just that picture helped deal with the anxiety, helped to take away that anxiety. Yes, I still keep a budget, but it doesn't control me like it used to. The money is much more available for using for God's purposes. We need episodes like this in our lives, and that's what formational prayer is all about. Yes, it brings healing. I can't say that, you know, we can't dictate to God what he wants to deal with, the, the things in our lives. But by opening ourselves up to the Lord in his presence, he will guide us into what he wants to deal with. I want to give you a homework assignment. We'll be starting a class in September on formational prayer. And I want you to join me with me on this journey um, just to see what the Lord has for you and what the Lord wants to speak to you. So my homework assignment for you today as we close is just to say, I want you to pray and ask the Lord, what, is, what issue do you want to deal with? Not, oh, I know it's this one over here or this one. No, ask the Lord because it'll be something that you weren't even expecting. Ask the Lord, what issue do you want to deal with? And then do this. This is the living with expectation. Ask him to point out an object in your everyday life that represents that issue. It's amazing the way the Lord will bring something up and he'll speak to you 
Yes, that's the object there, and this is what it means. So I challenge you with that, that assignment, and I invite you to join us for a formational prayer group in September. Come down, sit, sit down here with me, all right? I'm not Jesus, but as your brother, as your pastor, I believe Jesus wants you to know that he's so proud of you. You did great today. You really did. Thanks. Amen. <laughs> but he wants to affirm in your heart that he's, he's proud of who you're who you're becoming, who you are, who you're becoming. And um, I believe that through your experience, through your healing, God's going to use that in the hearts and lives of many of us who sit here who circle around some of the same sinful behaviors or just hurt or dysfunction. We don't know really where... It came, well, maybe we know where it came from, but we just haven't been able to address the root. And it's one thing to hear, I mean, I, I apologize to you because this was really unfair to unload all this in 30 minutes, right? There's so much more to work through. Um, you can hear a truth this morning and, and, and maybe God brought up to you an experience you had that really con has controlled you throughout your life and you, you haven't been able to detach from it completely. And it's hard to do that in 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. That's why I'm so excited for this group to start where Peter and Cheryl uh, are going to sit down with you and I and those that would like to be a part of formational prayer. And we're going to make room for the Holy Spirit to take God's word, the truth of his word that you already know. It's true, but it's maybe not real to you. Or it kind of comes and goes. Sometimes I feel it, sometimes I don't. And really it's the, the work of the devil to lie to you, to deceive you and me, and keep us from living out the best that, that Jesus has for us. And so I'm so excited. This is going to be a great group. It's going to start sometime in September. We're, not, we're still ironing out some of those details, what day it'll be on. But kind of keep your eyes open for it. Make sure you sign up and... And I, I know it's going to be a tremendous group where there's going to be a lot of healing. You know, Connie and I, we've helped many people with the Discovery Weekend. This is just such a add-on to that, and it just it's going to really help us to heal in deep places that the Holy Spirit wants to get to. And so I'm really, I'm, thank you, Peter and Cheryl. Thank you for sharing. And I know this is going to be a tremendous help to our church family. Amen. Why don't you all stand? And I need to let you go. But uh, praise God. I want to do, uh, after I pray, if you want to come forward for prayer, you need prayer for something in your life, maybe the Lord just kind of, you know, pricked your heart just a little bit and you'd like prayer for that. Peter's going to be here. Cheryl will come up and join uh, him for prayer. We'll pray for you. We'll anoint you with oil if you'd like. But uh, why don't you just come, if you need prayer, following my prayer here right now. I'd like you to invite you to come forward, all right? Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the strength that there is in this body. Thank you that there's Peter, they, people you're raising up like Peter and Cheryl to come alongside people and walk, um, walk with them in these journeys of the heart and, and some of these challenges that we tend to circle around. So I thank you for the truth of your word, that our minds can be renewed, our hearts can be renewed. And uh, we're going to make room for you, Lord, because you want to do such a great work in our hearts. I pray you be with each and every person today uh, and this week. Give us a powerful week in your presence. And uh, we're forever grateful for all that you're doing in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. If you like prayer, please come. Wow, church, well, we loved having our guests with us this Sunday. We hope that you guys enjoyed it as well. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Our information is listed below. Once again, folks, thank you so much for being with us again. Uh, we hope you guys have a blessed rest of your Sunday and a blessed week.
whatever.